This is our lecture on privacy. So basically today we are going to discuss about uh, privacy issues. Uh, what is important to ask at the very beginning uh, when we discuss about privacy is why care about privacy? And this is the core of what I, I'm going to discuss today. Because uh, there are a number of issues that Again, Deborah Johnson, in her book on computer ethics, has articulated. And uh, these issues are strongly related to the technologies, the information and communication technologies, which are the core of this course. So basically, what we are going to discuss is how the very notion of privacy is related and problematized in the case of information and communication technologies. And we will try to answer a number of questions. Of course, these are huge questions, very open. So I'm not sure I will be able to answer all of them. But uh, questions like, what is uh, the value of privacy? If there's any value in case of privacy. Or uh, what happens when privacy disappears? What are the consequences of the disappearance of privacy? Or uh, what are the consequences uh, into individuals and societies about the constant surveillance in the so of the societies in which we live in? And uh, we will uh, try to articulate a little bit better the uh, uh, idea, the notion of surveillance society. Okay? So, before doing that, it's important to try to provide a very general definition of privacy. And it's a general definition because the notion of privacy, again, it's a cluster concept. There are many issues around privacy and there's no just a single definition. But what is important for us is that the notion of privacy is not new. You can see here, this is the core of the notion of privacy that we discuss today and we use. This goes back to the end of 19th century, and it's the idea that privacy is the right to be left alone. So this is strongly related to the principle of unviolate personality. But Today, we are going to discuss about two different meanings of privacy, and these are the main general meanings of privacy. Okay, the first one is called constitutional privacy or de decisional privacy. This is the idea of privacy that is related to freedom and to the idea that basically everybody has the right to take his or her, or, or her own decisions uh, about the matters that are related to uh, the intimate and personal uh, uh, context in a free way. And we discuss many times and we use many times the idea of abortion as, as an example. Here's again precisely the notion of, of abortion, to have an abortion is related to the idea of constitutional privacy. So everybody is free to take a decision about this very intimate uh, uh, notion. But there's also another meaning, which is, of course, it's not completely different, but is partly different from this meaning, and it's the idea of tort or informational privacy. And I have to say that we will focus more on this idea in this lecture. What is tort or informational privacy? It's the idea that people have, again, the right to control personal information, information that is related to themselves, and uh, so they have to have control. Everybody has had to control on this information. And a very simple example is the case of the information then uh, uh, our personal information that is disclosed on, on, on social media. Okay, so this second notion of privacy is very much related to uh, the uh, um, notion of information, okay, related. What is important for us in this discussion is that, again, we have seen this idea in many other lectures, but again, the idea that privacy, the very notion of privacy, has co-evolved with the 
technologies that we are discussing, and in particular with the computer technologies, information and communication technologies. But what is important is what do I mean by this co-evolution? I mean that, of course, privacy has been shaped by the use and the advent of these technologies, but also that these technologies, at, as we will see in the end of the lecture, are also very much related to the evolution of the notion of privacy. Okay, so there's a, an idea of co-evolution. Okay, let's go back to what we have discussed about the three features of information and communication technologies. We have introduced ethics in the context of information and communication technologies, and we have seen that these technologies have three main features. The first one is reproducibility. I hope you remember we discuss a lot about this idea of reproducibility and uh, the example that we have considered is to copy a software or to steal a bike. And here reproducibility, again, please go back to what we have discussed. The copies are identical to the original one. The original one is left intact. So there's this element of reproducibility is very important. What's the relationship between reproducibility and privacy in this case? I think it's very important for us is that information can be very easily reproduced. And this is, of course, has an impact on privacy because it's very easy to manipulate. It's very easy to store. It's very, it, 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 it's very easy also to distribute. And this was the first characteristic. Then we discuss about identity conditions. What's the matter of identity conditions? We discuss that we, have, we can have different identity conditions, that the very notion of identity is different in the case of uh, information and communication technologies. I think that here, when we are going to discuss about privacy, what is very important for us is the idea that basically most of the activities that we do online are not uh, anonymous. We can be uh, tracked in several ways. Okay, so this is a case in which, of course, this lack of anonymity, this being tracked every moment, has, again, a very important impact on privacy. And then the third feature, the third characteristic is uh, the information flow, the type of information flow that is different from traditional media. We have a diversity of information channels. We have many-to-many, one-to-many, or one-to-one, -one, okay? And so we have to take into consideration these elements. These are very important elements. But let me add something more specific about the type and the diffusion of information that is very useful when we are going to discuss about privacy. First of all, there's a matter of scale of information. This is very important. Much more information is collected and it's very easy to collect this information. It's very easy to maintain this information. It's very easy to share this information, to manipulate, to use this information. So again, here, as this is not new, of course, but it's the degree of this scale that is new, okay? And, 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 and it's very peculiar of this particular socio-technical system. Then there's an issue about the type of information. We have many examples of new types of information that didn't exist before the invention of a particular technology. Like, for example, the trans uh, uh, transaction generated information didn't exist before the invention of this technology. So we can say that this is a new type of information. Then what is important also is related to the distribution of information. So because it's very easy to store and to uh, collect this information, uh, we have a situation in which this information is distributed more widely and more easily 
in a sense. Once the information is about an individual or about a group of individuals is recorded on a server, for example, then can be uh, given away, can be used by others, can be stolen, can be manipulated in many different ways. And this is also very important. And this has to do with distribution. Then there is a matter of endurance of information. What is endurance in this case? Is that this information uh, can be last for uh, a, a, a long period. And, and, and when information is stored electronically, uh, also because this kind of storage is not so expensive, there's no incentive to get rid of this information, okay? I think that you know very well that, of course, also these types of support in which we can uh, store our information can experience some problems. And we know very well that sometimes uh, to have information in books, in, physics, in physical books, can last more than uh, electronic type of storage. But what I think is very peculiar and very important in, 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 in this case, is the fact that there may be little incentive to get rid of this information. Because we can see that, of course, uh, uh, supports are different, uh, and the occupation of space, of, 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 of physical space is different. And then, and then, this is a very important element. It's the last element in this discussion about the information flow. The effects of erroneous personal information are magnified. What do I mean here? <coughs> that the erroneous information can spread out so quickly that it's impossible to keep track of this path, both because the path is very complex and articulated, and also because the path and, and, and is very fast. This, this process is very fast and is very, uh, is very articulated. So what I want to stress in this discussion is that we have to keep in mind all these elements. So we started in general with the idea of reproducibility of information in this context. Here, we have articulated in a more precise way some of the issues of inf the current information flow. And all these issues are important in our discussion about privacy. OK, now I want to discuss uh, more about the ethical issues in the discussion of privacy. And I will start by uh, what I think is a very bad argument. And I will try to offer counter arguments to try to destroy this kind of bad argument. And basically, the bad argument in general is uh, stated in this way. Oh, we have not to worry about privacy. There is no need to worry about privacy. So all this discussion, all this fuss about privacy is a sort of uh, overrated idea that privacy is important. OK, but let me try to articulate better this idea that we have not to worry about privacy. Because I think that if we are able to better articulate the idea, then we are able to better analyze in a critical way. And please keep in mind that I think, and I will provide arguments to precisely state the contrary of this idea. We have to worry about privacy, and we have to worry about privacy for a number of reasons. OK. Usually, the arguments, this argument is composed of three main lines of argumentation. The first line, and I think this is very common, and you have probably found this idea in many different contexts, and it's the idea that privacy only protects people, individuals that have something to hide. So basically, the idea is, OK, you are a good guy. You don't, you, don't, you, you don't have anything to hide. So you don't need to worry about privacy. This is a, a, also an example of 
a fallacy in the argumentation that we discussed together in the lecture about uh, ethical reasoning. And this is, I think it's a particularly dangerous, this line of argumentation is particularly dangerous because it, it's used in a bad way when you say, okay, no, I need, I, I, I do worry about privacy. And so again, by using a fallacy, people tell you, okay, because you have something to hide, okay? This is completely uh, fallacious from uh, an argumentative point of view, and we will see why and how. The second group of argument related to the idea that we do not need to worry about privacy is privacy is overrated. We keep privacy, we consider privacy too important. It's not so important. And a proof of this is that basically we are already living in societies uh, in which basically we have renounced to a lot of our privacy and still we are living well or some, some people say we are also living better than in the past. So it's not true that privacy is so important. And again, this is a very dangerous argument. And the third line of argumentation is that basically when we renounce to privacy, there are benefits. And these benefits are not only for the companies, for example, that use our data, but these benefits are also for us as individuals. So why not to exploit this possibility and why not to renounce to a little bit of our privacy to have and to gain these benefits. And again, this is a very uh, difficult argumentation to, to, to try to uh, criticize because it's based on the idea that we can have benefits. But Still, it's important, and we are going to discuss, to stress what kind of benefits we are talking about, okay? So, let me start with the first line of argumentation related to the idea that privacy is not so important. And I will discuss the counter-arguments against the idea that privacy only protects people that have something to hide, okay? So I will try to destroy this idea. It's not true. And uh, first of all, there is a very important element that we have to think about. Errors, erroneous information. Errors are very typical. Errors are everywhere. Errors occur even when we have the most perfect technology, but still, we cannot eliminate errors. And here, we are discussing about errors that have a very strong impact on the life of people. Both in the sense that because of these errors, some people can have a benefit denied, this is a possibility, but also because some people can be subject to a treatment that don't deserve. And typical case, it's the errors that can be associated to, for example, police databases uh, and the very strong consequences that these uh, error, errors can, be, can have on our lives. Okay, so there are different types of errors. Some errors are really important and the consequences of these errors are really strong. And this is the first element that we have to take into consideration. Second element, there are information that in some cases is unfair to use or not appropriate to use. Here, what is important is the context. And then later on in this lecture, we will discuss 
how the notion of context is very important for the shaping of the notion of privacy. It's very clear. There are cases in which you cannot use some personal information. It's inappropriate, or sometimes it's even illegal. Like, for example, and this is something happening already, the case in which the information that you post on a social network is used for, uh, uh, for a by a company for making a uh, hiring decision about people. Different contexts. This is, this is not only not appropriate, this is illegal, okay? But different contexts and the use of information from one context to another context. Okay, and it's, there are many cases, many examples. Sometimes it's not very easy to uh, draw a line between what is a appropriate or what is not appropriate, what is the demarcation line between uh, fair use of information or unfair use of information. But it's very important. And do we feel totally comfortable about sharing information, having information about our health to our bank, used by our bank? We can see that already. These are different contexts. And sometimes we feel uncomfortable to have this kind of fluidity between the information shared by amongst different contexts. Let's consider now the second part of the argument. I recall the point was to try to criticize the idea that we do not need to worry. And the second argument was privacy is overrated. We are already living in a society with let's say, very few privacy, or we have already given away many of, of much of our privacy, and basically we are living well. OK, this is very important. First of all, when we say, OK, it's true that many people not only don't worry about privacy, but they like to share private information. This is a fact. This is true, but this doesn't mean that privacy is not valuable, okay? We are making, a, sorry, we are, we are confounding two different elements. We are confounding the level of the practice, people like to share information, with the level of the values, in a sense. And I think that this is important, because if we recognize this point, we can say, OK, this is the reality. We observe, we see that many privacy don't, many people don't value privacy. It's true. But this is because maybe these people uh, uh, are uninformed, are naive, or they can be wrong. They, they are not aware of the importance of privacy and the consequences and the importance of the consequences related to privacy issues. OK, so we cannot just say, OK, people like to give away information, so privacy is not valuable. OK, that's very important. And what is more important for us is that sometimes people lack the awareness of the consequences and the uh, different levels of information that we have discussed. And some, there are cases in which people do something without knowing that this has some consequences that are against their own interests. Again, this is a fact. So it's a fact, but it doesn't mean that privacy is not important. There are cases in which we are not so fully aware of the complex uh, interrelation between privacy and technologies that we, do, we, we act 
in contrast with our own interests. And this is also more subtle <coughs> in the case of the current information and communication technologies, and we will also consider it later. It's subtle because sometimes we have no choice. Okay? What does it mean to have no choice? It means that when we want, if we want to use a service, then we have to give away some information. Otherwise, the consequence is that we cannot use this service. There's no, uh, uh, there's no other possibility. And it's true that, in a sense, we are always free to say and to decide, OK, I want to use this service in this case. But it's true that sometimes we are very used of using these services and we, uh, it's very difficult to decide, OK, I want to use any service anymore. OK, it's, uh, it, 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 it becomes a radical choice in a sense, OK? And what is very important is that sometimes we think that a choice has an impact only locally and we say, OK, I'm free, I decide that I, in this particular case uh, I'm totally aware of giving away this information, OK, I know, I know the context, uh, I agree with this, but what is more difficult to understand is that a choice related to a local sharing uh, can have a strong impact uh, also from a more global point of view. And this is important and this goes back to the features of information flow that we have discussed before. This is related in a very strong way with the idea that, for example, errors are magnified, that information is, e is easy to store, information is easy to manipulate, information is also easy to be spread out without any control. So we have to take into consideration that the local level becomes quite immediately a global level. And again, this is related to the particular socio-technical system of related to this technology. Let's consider the counter arguments related to three, the, the, the third element of discussion. Again, the general framework is privacy is not important and this is the third uh, articulation of this idea. And people that think that privacy is not important uh, Sometime, sometimes say, okay, privacy is not important, or better, is not so important, and anyway, we are having some benefits uh, in exchange of our uh, privacy, okay? And these benefits are not only for the companies, but are also benefits for us. And I think that here, the issue is very big, and it's an issue that, of course, is not, is not only ethical in the strict sense of the term, but it's more political and, uh, let's say, more general than, 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 than many of the other issues. And, and it's related to how uh, the, the information that companies have about ourselves is used. Is used to serve us as clients, is used to shape us as clients or is used to shape us as, in general, individuals that most of the time have to be clients, okay? So this is a very important issue. And I think that most of us today perceive that this line between to be served as customers and clients and to be used as customers and clients is a fuzzy line uh, in many cases. And the second issue is uh, again related to the context. Are we really sure that these organizations, companies, even states are using this information appropriately 
related to a specific context to take decisions about individuals, or these uh, different contexts of information are mixing, mixing up and basically we are not aware anymore of different contexts and different uh, rules related to the different contexts. Then here we can say, okay, let's consider, this is just a, a possible uh, uh, approach. Let's consider a, a utilitarian framework, okay? And let's say, okay, in a utilitarian framework, uh, what we want to have is to try to maximize uh, the total amount of happiness for the greater number, the greatest number of people, okay? And so if we use a utilitarian framework in this case, we can say, okay, let's try to measure the positive and the negative consequences of uh, giving away information, personal data, or not giving, or try to limit this, uh, and try to consider and to balance the negative consequences and the positive consequences. But this is a possibility, but we will see that there's more. It's not only a matter of individual choices, but it's a matter of social choices. And this is very, very important. Okay, let's now move to uh, the idea of privacy that basically uh, is the idea of privacy that we have discussed so far. So far, we have discussed the idea that privacy is an individual good. What do I mean by an individual good? I mean a good that is very important for the essence of individual that we have in mind, at least in some or the most of the Western societies. What's the point here? Privacy is important because it's related to other um, concepts and ideas, like the idea, the concept of autonomy, the concept of equality, that represent some type, some, in, in some way the essence of the uh, humanity in this idea. But basically so far we have discussed privacy as the idea that okay everybody should be responsible uh, about the personal, their own personal information uh, and how much uh, we want to share about it. And uh, this is true but please remember that we have discussed at the beginning of this course uh, that privacy is not an essential value, okay? We have discussed privacy as an instrumental value. This is very important. Uh, what do I mean by instrumental value in the case of privacy? An instrumental value means that privacy is not important per se, but it's important because of the values that are related to privacy and that if privacy disappears, also this has an impact on these values. And let me provide two examples. These are examples discussed in the literature, and I like that these examples are, in a sense, a discussion about privacy that is, uh, uh, let's say, distant from the current information technologies that we have today. And this example, the first example, is a paper that discusses how privacy basically is important to let develop uh, ideas like friendship, intimacy, and trust. If we do not have privacy, uh, we cannot develop these uh, ideas. In societies that are under constant surveillance, uh, basically uh, people are not able to develop these ideas. And this has been further elaborated some years after in a very nice paper that doesn't discuss anything about technologies, but elaborates the point that privacy is essential for the diversity of relationships. Basically, the kind of relationships that we have is based on the information that we share. Here, we have a relationship I'm your instructor, you are the students of this course. We share some information, but, but we do not share some other information. 
Then you go out, you have friends, you share some other information with friends, you share some other information uh, with family, with uh, your partner. So we have a diversity of relationships in our lives that are strongly related to the different levels of information that we decide to share. And this is a nice paper, again, because I think it's a good starting point to discuss about the very essence of privacy without discussing, uh, uh, I mean, without taking into consideration any technology. So privacy is important, not only because we have this type of technologies today that we have discussed, but privacy, according to this idea, is an, in, uh, 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 an instrumental values for some other important values, okay? And also, I don't know if you are reading the, the, the book, The Circle, but that a, a large part of the book is precisely related, or at least a part of the book is precisely related to this idea of privacy and sharing information. And in the book, you have many examples of let's say the absurdities and the problems that you have in societies in which you decide to share all your personal information, okay? In particular, not only the bad consequences, but also uh, uh, the, the problems related to the diversity of relationship. Okay, so far so good, but what's the problem if we just stay at this level? Okay, I hope to have substantiated the idea that privacy is important. I've discussed many of the possible counterexamples. And basically, I've tried to demonstrate that privacy is important, uh, is an individual good, is very important for individuals, and plays an, a, uh, an instrumental role to support, uh, I would say, generally, important rec uh, uh, recognized values by uh, people. The problem is that, and, and let me go this way, okay? Then I will just skip uh, a slide and go back. The problem is that if we stay only at the level that privacy is an individual good, we have a situation like this. We have situation that basically when we have two contrasting values like privacy, individual privacy and security or governmental efficiency, we always have that the other values uh, are considered more important. This was for example, uh, 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 it's a very clear example how uh, the U.S. Patriot Act passed to the U.S. Senate without basically any discussion after September 11 because people and, and, and the kind of narrative that was proposed at the time was we are in a war, we need protection, we want to protect you as citizens, so you have to renounce to at least a part of, uh, of your privacy, because the, 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 the act was uh, to try to, uh, I mean, it was a way to extend some surveillance uh, uh, on, on individuals from, from the state. Okay, and also I think that uh, it was also very evident in another famous case, more recent, that was discussed and the, that was the controversial between Apple and FBA uh, after the, uh, uh, the uh, about the, the, the telephones, uh, the iPhones of some terrorists after the San Bernardino attacks uh, in, in the United States. Here again was uh, that basically FBA pushed on the idea that you have to give, and, and in, in with respect to Apple, was okay, you have to give us the, the, the keys to these phones because it's a matter of security. And if you remember, Apple denied this because of the protection of, of its clients. Okay, of course, in this case, we have some, uh, let's say more, we have reasons that are related to, of course, uh, the business, the particular business uh, of Apple. But basically, these are examples in which we have from the one side privacy, which is an individual value, and from the other side, 
values like security that are collective, are social. And when we put these values uh, in these ways, we have a situation in which the social values, the common values, always wins. I think that we need to reconsider privacy as a social good. And this is a more recent uh, discussion in, 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 um, by the scholars studying privacy. And it's very important. And I think it's very important. And I suggest to use this idea in general also if you want to make a presentation or to write a paper about privacy. What's the idea of privacy as a social good? The idea is that basically uh, you also, if you want to use a utilitarian calculus, the idea is that we should consider privacy important not only for individuals, but also for societies. What's the reason of that? Why privacy should be important for society? Because privacy is an instrumental good to allow values that are important for societies and to make these values important. And we will see in a minute what does it mean in, in practice. But I think that if we accept that privacy is a social good, then when we have to make a choice between two social goods, then the balance is, in a sense, is more fair than if you have an individual good and a social good. What I want to say is that this is not a solution. Please remember that ethics is a process. It's not a manual with answer. So any time we have to consider the particular solution and to develop a particular solution for a particular case. What I'm trying to say is that, of course, if we want to develop a solution and if we want not to exclude privacy already from the beginning of the discussion, we have to consider privacy as a social good. Otherwise, when we have a comparison between an individual good and a social good, the social good always win. And in the debate about privacy and security, it's very important to reframe the whole discussion. Otherwise, it's of course, if security is a social good and privacy is an individual good, security always win, wins. To uh, make this argument a little bit more precise and stronger, I think it's important to add some more uh, information and, and a more general discussion about this element. And here, the key concept is the concept of autonomy. So autonomy is a key concept to discuss privacy as a common good. Why? Let's consider this uh, example. This is a prison. It's a, a, a way of, of, of designing a prison. And this particular prison is called panopticon. Okay? And, and it's a very special type of prison, as you can see. It's a prison usually made of with a round uh, uh, a shape the, uh, and a tower in the middle and the cells are all around. And this is, a, and, and I will say more about this prison, but basically a very used, much used metaphor today is that basically current societies, information societies today, today are sort of panopticon-like societies, are societies in which we are under constant observation. Why? Because basically this is a way to uh, implement this idea of panopticon is used because panopticon was used exactly to implement this idea. You have the guard in the middle of the prison, you have the cells all around the prisons, so you have one single guard and, and, and all the cells are made of, are, are, have the, the part in front of the guard made of glass. And basically the guard tower can see all the cells just being in the middle of the prison. But 
What's more in this kind of metaphor is that basically prisoners could not see the guard in the tower. So prisoners, in a sense, don't even know whether the guard is in, in the tower or is not in the tower. They even know if they are actually observed in that particular moment or are not observed in the particular moment. But what's the consequence of this, pres of this shape of the prison? I think it's very obvious. The consequence is that basically all the prisoners believe that they can be seen. They don't know. But ideally, they can be observed any moment. And basically, they adjust their behavior and adhere to the norms of the prison because they have the idea that they can be observed. So this is a clear example to, and, and, and that's why this metaphor is used. The metaphor is used because it's very simple. And I, I think it's very also uh, dramatic in a sense. It's an, a metaphor in which basically the element that people want to stress is that basically we are living in societies in which we don't even know to be observed, to be under surveillance, but anyway, because we know that there's this possibility, we adjust our behavior. We are not autonomous anymore. We are not free anymore because we have to adhere to the general norms of societies and we are because we perceive that we are under constant surveillance. I don't know, I, I mean, I don't know if we don't have time to discuss if this is a good metaphor or a bad metaphor or better, if this metaphor works or doesn't work or until the degree or, 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 or to which this metaphor works. But I think that this very, what is important for us in this discussion is that is related to autonomy, to the idea of autonomy. Of course, in a prison, you are not autonomous anyway. That, that's a particular, very precise and particular context. But in a sense, when we are observed, we are not autonomous anymore. And it doesn't need um, uh, any, any way that we are observed in reality, the only the, the, the perception that we could be observed, it's enough to make our behavior adjust to the adherence to some social norms. So this idea of autonomy is very important and is related to democracy. Why? Because we have discussed many times how democracies are, uh, uh, how in democracies autonomy plays an essential role. So basically that's the connection through the notion of, of autonomy, of privacy, to the idea of democracy. How does it work? It works like that. If we live in societies uh, that are increasingly uh, mm, uh, using information technologies to uh, uh, put in practice uh, surveillance of the individuals, uh, we live in societies in which basically we are not free anymore to act without taking into consideration this surveillance. And uh, basically, there are two problems. First is the problem that is related to the effect on our freedom. We are not free anymore. We lose our autonomy. But then also, there is a second element which is very important. Who are our watchers? And, and, and how do these watchers uh, decide to observe the behavior? What are the values that are used to evaluate these behaviors? And both elements have a very strong impact on the traditional notion of democracy. 
Again, I don't want to say that, okay, we, have, we should stay on the traditional notion of democracy. Okay, I'm not discussing this point. What I'm discussing is that it's very important to be aware of the connection between this idea of observation, autonomy, and the idea of democracy that we have. Then we, we, we can decide that we want to have another idea of democracy, we want to, cha to change this idea. But what is important is that if we accept the idea of democracy that we are using today, we have to accept that individuals have to be autonomous. Otherwise, basically, democracies cannot exist. Then, of course, this is very difficult because uh, it's difficult the very notion of autonomy, the degree of autonomy. Many times, and, and this is also related to freedom, many times in, in this course we have discussed, okay, are we really free? Is it true that we are free, but we have many, let's say, influences we live in, in, in a way that is influenced by many factors that, in a sense, we are not free. But I hope that you can observe that in this case, these two elements are very strong. Okay? There is a shift from traditional ideas that is a very strong shift. And this is why, in a sense, I'm arguing that privacy is not only an individual good, but is a social good. Without the notion of privacy as a, as, as a social good, we cannot have democracies like the democracies that we start to have some, some centuries ago. Okay, this is very important. And basically, nowadays we are in a period in which basically we live in with, with the idea, with the traditional idea of democracy, but then we are experiencing also the change of the notion of privacy and how the notion of privacy is eroding this idea of the traditional democracy. Okay, I hope you have seen some parts of the debates that some last week uh, uh, Mark Zuckerberg had with the commission of the, the, the uh, um, um, US representatives and how, of course, uh, you can see the, the, the contraposition with two very different ideas and two different systems of values, okay? Then you can say, okay, but this is there are many other methods in this case that, 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 that are important. It's true, but it's true also that it's, we are living precisely in a moment in which the tr some traditional values like democracies, if we think that democracies are, are, are important, and new practices like uh, the way in which we deal with privacy issues are in contrast and are causing a lot of problems, okay? Not only individual problems, but problems that we can uh, frame as collective problems, okay? It's not just my matter, your matter, or the matter of somebody else. It's a collective matter. Okay, now I want to add uh, more Another point, and then I will discuss some possible strategies. So I don't want to be only uh, disruptive in, in, in only um, uh, criticizing and, and, and without any uh, positive proposal. So I will discuss some of the possible strategies to deal with these problems of privacy. But let me add another point, which is, of course, derives from the idea of privacy, uh, but is again something that has an impact on our lives individually and collectively. So, and here again is uh, something that we have just discussed in this, in this class, and it's the idea that, of course, 
the problem is not only that we are being tracked and monitored and, and, and so on, but the problem is that these decisions are not subject of public discussion. Okay? These decisions are not the result of a democratic process. And this is exactly the same argument that we have discussed in the lecture uh, presenting the moralization of technologies. The idea that we, we can have technologies that promote positive effects, that is good, of course, but that these decisions are not made on a democratic basis. Companies decide, group of people decide, but they are not the object of a democratic process. And here is the same. There's no public discussion. It's not a matter of negotiation. It's just something that we experience and whose results we experience, but in which we cannot say anything, basically. So uh, this is very important. And also, this relates to the notion of invisibility. If you remember uh, Moore, Jim Moore, in the paper, What is Computer Ethics, uh, introduces the idea of the invisibility factor. And he says that computers uh, and, and, and the types of abuses that we can do it by, by using computers uh, are subjected to what he calls uh, the invisibility factor. Here, invisibility is also an element that we have to take into consideration. And, and in particular here is the invisibility uh, of the, uh, let's say, of the norms that are used uh, and, and, and by using which these decisions are made. Okay, they are not public, they are not open, they are just there, used, but without a public discussion. Okay, let's try to see the positive part of this discussion, okay? I hope to have stressed how privacy is important, how privacy is important, not only at the individual level, but more, let's say, at a collective level. Why? Because privacy is essential for autonomy and without autonomy, basically, we cannot have democratic societies. So we have to consider in the debate about the balance between two conflicting values like privacy and security, both values at a collective level. What we can do today about all these issues related to privacy? One possibility is, let's call it the traditional possibility about but the traditional strategy. And, and, and to show you how this strategy is, let's say, traditional, I will present some of the articles of a code of conduct that was conceived in the 1970s. So basically in a moment in which people didn't experience uh, the type of technologies that we are experiencing today. And this is the Code of Fair Information Practices, published uh, in 1973. And I think that basically it's already there. Everything that is important is already there. And it's that, OK, there must be no personal data recorded uh, just, just as a secret, everything if, if there's something that is recorded should not be a secret, or that uh, it must be clear how information is used, cannot be used, uh, cannot be collected for a purpose and then used for another purpose, and uh, should be that people are aware and give, they have to give their consent to the use of the, the, the information, so information cannot be used uh, with, uh, without the consent of the people uh, affected by and, and, and the, the, also the people uh, to which, uh, to whom the information is referred. Uh, there must be a way for individuals to correct, to amend 
uh, 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 information which is not correct about him or her. And, and basically, uh, any organization should be responsible and must assure that uh, the data are reliable. I think that more or less, these are issues that we are very worried today of. And basically, we could say it's already, everything is already there in this code. But we have two problems in the case of codes. First, codes are just suggesting good behaviors, but they are not legally bounding. Okay, so this is, that's, that's a way to suggest that should be in this way, but it's not the case that if you do not this, then you will have some consequences in, in legal terms. Okay, that's the first issue. And so we are not sure that everybody is able to respect and is, is willing to respect these type of these types of, of uh, approaches and, and strategies. And then there's a, a second problem. And the second problem is, OK, this was written and published 1973. What's about today? And I think that in, in Europe, we experience a huge gap between the code, the legislation, also uh, if you think about the um, more recent uh, um, um, uh, regulation about privacy in, in, in Europe, and the technologies, and the fact that already the socio-technical system is moving to one direction, and there's a, 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 a body that tries to regulate this huge socio-technical system that is very difficult to regulate and you know that sometimes is impossible okay so basically we are experiencing a situation in which you put some regulations you even put some rules you even decide some laws which are, which are regularly bounding bounded but then you have a gap between what you write in the rules and the practice and we are experiencing this gap. So that's, I think, a, a, a very clear example of what we have discussed about active responsibility. We cannot just say, OK, let's develop these technologies and then see what's happened and then try to regulate after the technologies are put in place. It's not possible, OK? That's a case in which we need to, we, we, we uh, of course, maybe now it's a little bit too late, but it's a case in which we need to develop technologies in line with the assurance of some of these desiderata. Let's consider a strategy which is uh, more related to this idea of active responsibility. And uh, uh, this is more related to the idea of transparency, OK? Um, and uh, it, is, it has to deal uh, with transparency. Uh, it's because, in a sense, uh, we, 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 we lack information as clients and as customers, as users. Most, most of the cases, we lack information. Or we are in a situation in which this information is given, but then it's too complex, OK? It's, it's too complex. We do not have time to read all this information. We do not have the knowledge to understand all this information. So it's a sense in which this information about the use, the storage, the maintainers of, of this personal data is present, but because it's difficult, it's long, is um, uh, uh, not very easily accessible, then it doesn't make any difference in practice. So that's very important. And, and a, a very clear example is the policies that I can call opt-in, which is very different from the current policy that we have today, which is called opt-out. 
What's the point today when we are faced with the choices about the using of some service? The point is that basically the company gives us some information and tell us, okay, if you do not agree with this information, you can decide not to use my technology, my, this tool, and to opt out from this use. Why not to reconsider this issue under a different perspective? Why not having companies and, 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 and in general uh, um, services uh, uh, that try to convince us to opt in these technologies, these services, these tools? And they have to convince us by showing the use of the information, the fair use of information, to guarantee that the information is used only for some particular purposes and not for uh, the others. Okay, this is a, a, let's say, a sort of change of perspective. It's a radical change of perspective that has to do not only the way we users can interact with this problem, but I think it's very important because it has to do also on the way that professionals, people that design these systems should consider in the design of these systems. So this is a design problem in a sense, and it starts from a requirement which is different from the usual requirement. So, and it's the idea that these companies have to inform us and to convince us to opt uh, in. And the third types, uh, type of strategy is particularly related to you. It's for you. For, to you in the sense that you are the future professionals, people that are going to design new uh, socio-technical systems in a sense. And in a sense, uh, we want already from the beginning to take into account. We, ideally, we should like to have already from the beginning to take this element, this problem into account, okay? And it's very important the role that, for example, computer professionals have to, to, in protecting, in designing systems that can protect privacy. This is what is called privacy by design in the current debate. There's a huge discussion that privacy by design doesn't work ideally, that there's always some margin of, of risks related to privacy, but privacy by design is the idea that you start already in the design of a, of a system, of a technological system, to protect privacy, because you recognize that privacy plays an important role, and so you design a system that take into account this important role. So a system that doesn't allow some possibility that uh, are in contrast uh, with the protection of privacy. And you know very well that the, the, the way in which an architecture of IT system is, is designed plays a very important role in protecting or not protecting uh, data and, and privacy related to this uh, data. And, and uh, uh, I think that this type of strategy is important because, in a sense, because you are the professionals and you are the experts about all these issues, you know very well about the security and reliability of the system, so you are the better, the best people to try to design systems that are compliant with some of these uh, values. And this is an example, again, of something that uh, can be used today. It's a code for computer professionals, and I want to mention, because this code was already, uh, it's the code of the ACM. ACM is one of the most important computer associations in the world, Association for Computing Machinery. It's a code that they start to develop many years ago, but it has been revised recently. And uh, it has been revised, and there is a very nice part related to uh, individuals' privacy and to the protection of individual privacy. 
uh, which is, I think, it's not very different uh, from uh, the code of the 1970s that we have considered. What's different in this code is that basically uh, the people writing this code they have considered they are computer professionals but also experts in ethics and they have considered uh, more recent technologies, the, 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 the situation that we have today. Uh, and, and for example, a very important point is about the security of data and, and also uh, you can see that there are more part of the code that are very specific with respect to the code that, that we have analyzed before, like for example to determine the required retention period of the data and, and, and something like that. So if you, in, you, if you are interested, you, you can have a look of, of this code. And just to summarize what we have discussed today, it's not true that we do not have to worry about privacy. We do have to worry about privacy. And uh, I, I've tried to substantiate this element by using examples and by providing an analysis of the reasons why privacy is important. Then I try to enlarge our discussion by moving from the traditional notion of individual privacy to the current notion of privacy that is a social good. So it's not only an individual good, but is a social good. And then I have discussed how privacy is related to autonomy, how uh, we cannot have autonomy if we do not have uh, some level of, of privacy. And I put in connection the notion of autonomy with the notion of uh, uh, democracy. And then I conclude just providing uh, some possible strategies in dealing with these privacy issues. And I hope you have noticed that these strategies are uh, organized in, in different levels. There are strategies for you as professionals, strategies in general for uh, regulators, and, 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 and political bodies, strategies for the users, and so on. And here you can find some of the references of what I have discussed today. And I think that these references also can be useful if you are interested in making a presentation or uh, writing a paper um, about privacy.